is Brian Brown. Brian is the pugnacious president of the National Organization for Marriage, which for nearly 15 years has been at the center of just about every righteous fight to defend marriage in the United States and outside of the United States. And if you're, if you're not on NOM's mailing list, you should be. This is a very bad thing if you're not on their mailing list because this is the principal body and Brian is one of the great champions in the public arena to pay marriage. So I'd urge you, as with all our speakers, to look them up after the conference is over, explore what they've been up to. Brian has been educated in history in California, in the University of California system and at Whittier College, but also at Oxford University. He may have picked up some of his fine main school skills when he was in Oxford. He, again, like C.R. Wiley, has a very telling line that says it all and points to the deepness of his authority for tonight, and that is the line on his official bio that reads, Brian and his wife, Susan, have eight young children. So without further ado, I'll disappear again. And Brian, thank you for your patience through the technical difficulties. I look forward to your comments. Thank you so thank much, you so Dr. Faye. It's great to see you again. And uh, I'm very happy to have the chance to speak today. I'll try and cut right to the chase. Uh, typically, uh, I speak about a very uh, basic question that unfortunately in our day and age is no longer uh, uh, is no longer held uh, by all, and that is the clear and obvious distinction between men and women, mothers and fathers, husbands and wives. So I'm happy to get beyond uh, that most basic distinction, because often when we only deal, when we're stuck dealing with the most obvious question, and when we have a, a debate over the sort of starting point, we never, we're never able to get further into it. And I sometimes feel that that is uh, the lot of those of us who've thrown our hat in the ring to defend such things as marriage is the union of a man and a woman, the distinction between male and female, and, and uh, other items that at this point in history, unfortunately, uh, are not uh, at least at an elite level uh, widely accepted. So today I want to talk about what appears to be uh, quite obvious, but I think is something that we need to spend some time uh, thinking about and uh, teasing out the implications of, and that is that the only way, in my view, to uh, be a good and strong father is to be a good and strong husband uh, in the, the normal situation of family life. Uh, what I mean is that uh, it's clear all around us, and Dr. Fahey brought up some of the obvious implications. We know from sociologist after sociologist the implication of the breakdown of the family. We know that the breakdown of the family, the, the, the strongest correlation we see is between the lack of fathers and societal breakdown. Whatever we want to measure, we see that um, the breakdown of fatherhood has led to increased incarceration rates. Uh, 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 boys especially, uh, lower graduation rates, girls, earlier um, uh, loss of chastity, on and on and on and on. These implications are, are very widespread. But at the root of all of this is, is the failure of fathers to be good husbands to be dedicated. So the two issues, fatherhood and good marriages are linked together uh, in, in ways that have to do with the same virtues, but also the same vices. Uh, and so I wanna try and attack that in a sort of different way. And I think that the having a Zoom call allows us to experiment a little bit. So forgive me if, if you don't uh, find this the most interesting, but I'm trying to try a little different angle at coming to the uh, coming at the question of how do we get good husbands and good fathers? So instead of looking at um, uh, classical literature, instead of looking at biblical admonitions, uh, I want to look at something that has interested me for for ever since I had the chance to visit, and that is uh, uh, 
an apparition of St. Joseph. Uh, obviously, Joseph in the Bible is uh, the head of the Holy Family. Uh, we're admonished repeatedly as Catholics to look at his example. But there have been very few uh, apparitions of St. Joseph approved by the church, and even less uh, so are those apparitions widely known. So what I want to begin with and what I want to focus on here is one single apparition uh, in Cotignac, France in 1660, and discuss briefly, uh, think about why that is important for uh, a, a proper image of being a good husband and a good father. So the story is, and again, this is an approved apparition, uh, that in the south of France, in the Provence region, uh, there was a shepherd, 22 years old, uh, tending a sheep, and uh, his name was Gaspard Ricard. He was, uh, you know, in the fields, and he has a vision. He sees he sees Saint Joseph, and Saint Joseph doesn't say much. Now that's the first point uh, in Scripture. Saint Joseph doesn't say much. Uh, there's sort of a strong, silent type. Uh, nature to what we see of St. Joseph in scripture, but in this apparition, it's also true. What he says is, uh, clearly the shepherd is thirsty, and it's getting very hot. It was June 7th, and he says, I am Joseph, lift that rock and drink. Now the shepherd looks down at the rock and, and thinks to himself, uh, that would take eight people to lift. Uh, but uh, he looks up at St. Joseph after all, so he, he, he actually looks up and he says uh, something like, I don't know if I can do this. St. Joseph points again, he lifts, and all alone he lifts the rock, there is water. And ever since to this day, there have been um, uh, claims of miracles from that water at that site. Again, not very well known, but I want to to, to look at this and point out three aspects of this uh, apparition that I think are quite useful to, to shed light on the example of St. Joseph as the Holy Father and what this apparition says about what he deems important. And I think the first thing is, why ask the shepherd to lift the rock? Clearly the rock is too large. And so I think that strength is number one, the idea that uh, a man should be willing to uh, be strong, should, should challenge himself, even when things appear undoable, do them. And uh, this the shepherd does. And uh, even if the shepherd himself has doubts about his ability, I think that is a good little uh, window frame around what we as men must do in the current uh, situation we find ourselves in. Even if everyone around us seems to be losing our heads, we have an obligation to take up leadership in our homes and to be strong and to be an example of strongness, uh, an example of strength. Uh, I think that that's one aspect of this apparition. And it's uh, it, it, the second is, I think, also quite important. We see this from uh, Joseph's own, St. Joseph's own life, and, and that is obedience. Um, when the shepherd has second thoughts about his ability to lift this rock, uh, St. Joseph doesn't back off. <laughs> he doesn't decide, no, 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 uh, okay, he, he's just not going to be able to do it. He assumes that he will obey, which uh, the, the, the shepherd does. And so, you know, obedience to, to uh, our faith, obedience to Christ himself, obedience to our, uh, the demands of our station in life, obedience to lawful authority, all of these things, I think, are something that we must model. Uh, and that is the modeling aspect of this is very important. And I think that that is what this apparition is. It's a, it's a, it's a way of modeling a proper behavior. Finally, uh, we see this from St. Joseph's whole life, and it may seem at odds with the first point strength, and that is a certain form of humility. Uh, I don't mean here uh, groveling, 
what I do mean here is just as I brought up obedience, we, we, there's, we must have a certain humility to, to not think we know everything and that we obey the authorities that are, are rightly over us. If St. Joseph comes and tells you something to do, you, you of course do it. Uh, if the church has certain, um, uh, calls you to do certain things, of course you, you, you do them. And even when you are uh, giving direction, even when you are being strong, a certain amount of, of humility. Again, you don't see St. Joseph uh, uh, go on a tirade attacking the shepherd for not immediately listening to him. <laughs> uh, that isn't what happens. Instead, uh, there, there is a certain um, humility that he expects both from the shepherd, but also in a sense from St. Joseph himself. So uh, these, these are three things that, that I think come out of this. Now, why do I think this particular apparition uh, is important? Well, I'll tell you one reason. Uh, the, the bishop of this region, Fréjus Toulon, is a Bishop Dominique Ray. And from this apparition, and out of respect for this apparition, he has, over the course of the last 20, uh, well, 15 years, he, he created a new order of priests uh, devoted to, to St. Joseph. And, by the way, devoted to the family, through St. Joseph, devoted to the family. And this is one of the many fruits that have come out of this apparition. And this, this order of priests counts as its uh, members, many young priests, uh, some of whom have come from the United States. One is a, is, a, is a friend I knew from Princeton University. He, he has joined this order. And it, the reason I think that this order is growing is because there is a deep void for this sort of spirituality, this sort of devotion, sort of the, uh, focus on a manly devotion to St. Joseph and to our role as husbands and fathers. Uh, second, and, and uh, less important, but I think also uh, a reason, is if you ever have a chance to visit, this is in the south of France. It is a beautiful, beautiful place, uh, full of uh, lavender and many other um, apparitions, in, including um, apparitions of, of Our Lady, uh, so, King Louis the Fourteenth visited the apparition site uh, his first year of uh, after being crowned king, and also went to an uh, apparition site of Our Lady that occurred there. So it's a beautiful place to visit. And at this time in history, I think um, when manhood is so much called into question, I, I do think that this is a prime time to reconsider uh, Saint Joseph as a model. Uh, to spend some time thinking about and studying uh, aspects of St. Joseph we might not be aware of, especially uh, these very uh, undeservedly, uh, undeservedly un unwell-known uh, apparitions. And if, if that is not your thing, if you're not a, not a huge fan of the apparitions, well, at the very least, there have been some, there's been some very good writing on St. Joseph and uh, his role as head of the Holy Family that I think it serves as a, a model for all of us as husbands uh, and fathers. So uh, with that, I, I will thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Fahey. Thank you, Thomas More College. And uh, look forward to any questions folks might have. Thank you very much, Brian. I think that uh, St. Joseph provides us with a great example of the kind of gravitas that uh, Christopher Wiley was talking about. But as, as you said, um, his silence is, is amazing. I mean, he is one of the most interesting figures in scripture where he, he listens. So he himself is obedient, one of the virtues that you highlight, highlighted. He listens. He's prompted through his dreams by God. He acts for the sake of his family, but he... He doesn't need to say anything. He demonstrates his headship of the family, his leadership through his actions. So thank you for that talk. Thank you.